Hello, everybody. I'm going to start, and maybe some more people will show, but I don't know. But my name is Catherine Imbriglio, and I uh, teach in the nonfiction writing program. And I'm welcoming you to our fourth annual alum forum. Um, and I appreciated our, my former students uh, coming and um, to speak to you about uh, their careers in writing, particularly after after Brown, and not just in writing, but in, as an activist. So I'm just going to briefly introduce um, the panelists. Then I'm going to ask each one of them to tell uh, you a little bit about their post-Brown career track. Um, and then they're going, to, they're going to read a little bit from what they've written for about five, four or five minutes. And then we'll open up the... Uh, We'll open up for questions, okay. Uh, but first of all, I really want to thank Ellen Viola, who is sitting in the front row over here for all the work she's done, all the administrative, you know, keeping me on track, <laughs> reminding me of, um, more than once. <laughs> and then um, also my colleague, Carol DeBoer Langworthy, who is at the other book ending, uh, and she has been helping us uh, with all the speakers in our, in our speaker series, so I appreciate your help bo from both of you. Thank you. Okay, on my immediate right is Erica Swie Swiegershausen. Uh, did I get it? Yeah. <laughs> this is the first time. In <laughs> um, she was the managing editor of the Indie when she was here at Brown. Uh, she was also one of our nonfiction award winners. Um, um, and she's going to tell you what the things that she's been doing after Brown. Sab uh, Sabrina e Embler, who was our baby, uh, <laughs> she's the youngest. She just graduated two years ago. She was the Brown, one of the Brown commencement speakers here when she, she, she was a graduate. She was writing for the Catalyst and for the BDH. Um, and then to her right is April Freely, who was my first student who got accepted at the premier writing program in the United States, the University of Iowa. She was in the nonfiction track. Um, she would be very good to, to talk about the pros and cons of going to a place like Iowa. Um, so I'm encouraging her to, to do that. And, and subsequently, she's had loads of, um, of fellowships, and I'm anxious to hear what you're working on with all those fellowships, okay. Um, and to my, fa the furthest is Dan Shirell, who was not an, actually an in English concentrator. He was in, envi in environmental studies, but he had a book, a book, a, an article or an essay accepted in the Colorado Review before he graduated. And then it was a, a, not about environmentalism, it was about high school wrestling. And that was subsequently anthologized in the best American sports writing. So that was really a coup. Uh, very, very proud of him. And he's going to, he is now going back to writing, so he tells me. Uh, so he's going to tell you a little bit more about that, the specifics. So uh, that said, I'm going to ask Erica to start and tell us a little bit about the career track uh, after Brown. Like, what do you do after you, after you leave here? So, Erica, okay. so what, what did you do? <laughs> and the other, the other burning question is, how do you support yourself as a, as a writer? Okay, so that, I hope you either ask that or address it. Okay, sure. Um, go ahead, Erica. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I graduated from Brown in 2013 and pretty much immediately moved to New York City um, to do an internship for nymag.com, um, specifically their site, The Cut, which is sort of like women's interest, feminism, fashion, all of that. Um, and so I was interning there for about six months, um, doing sort of basically whatever they asked me to do, along with a couple blog posts here and there. Um, and then eventually got hired as an editorial assistant, um, and then sort of became a more of a blogger um, and was doing that for about two years. Um, which, let's see, the thing that was really great about it and that uh, I really appreciated was we, there was just the opportunity to write constantly. Um, there, 
it was a website. They were sort of very concerned about having traffic on the website. And so there was the expectation that sort of everyone on staff would be pitching and you would pitch something and it would just be like, okay, do it. Um, so yeah, so for those two years, I guess I was doing a combination of news blogging, um, some fashion writing, interviews and profiles of artists and writers. Um, yeah, sort of a smorgasbord. Um, and so after two years of doing that, I was a little burnt out um, because of the pace, long hours. Um, so I took a year to freelance um, and apply to grad school. Um, and so I guess, yeah, so I applied to a number of MFA programs, uh, ended up deciding to go to Hunter College for their MFA program and memoir um, because I wanted to return to some of the work that I'd started at Brown, um, particularly a memoir about um, my brother's sudden unexplained death when I was five. And so for the past two years, I've been doing that. Um, I guess working part-time tutoring, and now I'm uh, adjuncting at Hunter, teaching intro to creative writing. Um, and let's see, what else can I say about the MFA experience? It's been great. I've learned so much, and um, I think I think I went in knowing that I wanted to write a book, and it's been really helpful to have a community of people to sort of show that workshop with, um, advisors, uh, people to sort of think about structuring a book, and then, you know, eventually, hopefully this summer, selling a book. And yeah, that's where I'm at right now, I guess, hoping when I graduate this spring to, yeah, continue working on this book and continue teaching. And one question, how was the financial support at Hunter for everyone in the, in the class? Um, so Hunter, uh, if you're in New York State, um, the tuition is totally covered. Um, but, other, and, but other than that, there's no, there's no stipend. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's tough, most people, but all of our classes are at night, so most people work either part or full time. Yeah. Tell us your, your track right after Brown. Uh, well, so what's, what's important to know is that during Brown, like in the summers between my junior, or my sophomore and junior year, I had, I interned for the week, which is like a, a news and culture magazine, and then I interned at Scientific American the summer after uh, through a program run by the American Society of Magazine Editors, which places you at, you, you get accepted to the program and then they just place you somewhere. So I could have been chosen to the American Association of Retired People's Magazine or <laughs> in style, but I got Scientific American. Um, and I started writing a lot of clips there, uh, which was very cool, and that kind of put me on a track to do a lot of science journalism, which wasn't something that I signed up for, but I grew to love. After I graduated, I interned at Audubon Magazine, which is a magazine about birds, and I wrote about birds for three months. I don't really like birds, um, but it was, a really, it was a really cool job, and then I moved to Seattle for six months to do a fellowship with an environmental blog called Grist, and at Grist, I wrote a lot about environmental justice um, and also did some video journalism in case anyone has questions about that. I did those kind of explainers that are like, what's the deal with Standing Rock? Like, let's break it down. Um, and then I was really, I hated Seattle. Um, so then I moved back to New York and I got an internship at my favorite magazine, um, Nautilus, which is like a science literary magazine. Um, and they said that they would pay me and then didn't really end up paying me. So just mm -hmm. general note, um, yeah. whenever you get an offer letter, um, you, need to screen, you need to save that to your personal email, not your new work email that they will delete after you leave on bad terms. Um, you also should save your timesheets. You should screenshot them. You should make a note of like how much you're owed. And just like this stands for any kind of expectation that you agree to in an internship, whether that's your duties if you don't end up doing what they say that you'll be doing or if they don't pay you. Um, and I eventually was paid more of what I was owed because I called them out on Twitter. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a nightmare. And so I was like really scrambling for a job. And I was lucky enough to land my current one, which is. Uh, I am a staff writer in the kitchen team of a review of a product review site called Wirecutter, 
Um, it's, we write like 6,000 to 10,000 word reviews of like toasters. Um, it's very cool. We are owned by the New York Times, so we do a lot of collaborations for them. Like, it was very cool. I got to write for the New York Times gift guide. Um, and we are working a lot in terms of like, what can like long form features look like with product reviews. Um, but I also, oh, I, I forgot. So when I was at Audubon, that was a, that was a part time internship. And so I couldn't afford to live in New York getting paid $10 an hour for two and a half days of work. So I got this freelance job writing clickbait which I had for two years, and that was really important. And like, if you can get a steady recurring job, like freelancing anywhere, um, I highly recommend it, because even if you kind of have a thing, media is really crazy, and you never know when that thing is gonna slip out of your fingers. So like, high recommend for a steady freelance thing. But anyway, now that I have this staff job, it's really nice, because it's a strict nine to five, so I still do freelance in my spare time. Um, I write still for Audubon, and I also, recently got this column at this online magazine called Catapult, um, where once a month I write like a personal essay about uh, the ocean and my identities as a QPOC. So that has been a cool thing that I've been doing recently. Mm. Excellent. And she's seen a beast on whales. And <laughs> ethics, too. <laughs> Good. All right. So it's come back a little bit. Excellent. OK. Now April. Uh. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, I went to Brown a while ago, and when I first left, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do. Um, I just moved back home to Ohio, and I got a job working in education in a nonprofit, and I just wanted there more community. I wanted to talk to people about writing. I wanted to uh, be thinking about how to improve, so I applied for grad school. I ended up going to Iowa. Um, what should I say? Oh, when I, before, before I went there, I had a, a professor at Brown who was not Catherine, who said, don't go there, you won't be good. <laughs> but I was like, oh wow, no, maybe it's different now. Uh, maybe it's gonna be great. So I went and I, I really, I like the nonfiction program. It's a little bit different uh, than the workshop. It's one of the older programs. I think it may be the oldest uh, nonfiction program that we have. And uh, I studied with John Degada, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then I worked with a lot of poets, so uh, my thesis advisor at the end of our three-year program was Mary Rufel. I also worked with the uh, uh, CD was on my uh, thesis committee too um, back in the day. So it was it was a it was an interesting place to think about the kinds of things that essays can do. Um, it is in Iowa City, and it uh, you can have assumptions about Iowa City. They're going to be somewhat not wrong. I really love being a writer there because you could go to the bank and when they ask you, oh, how are you employed? What is your deal? You can just put your writer and then they're cool with it. So it felt like a really great place. They have great reading series. Everybody's super knowledgeable. Um, it's a great place to be a writer. Uh, I, I don't know how it is now. I don't know how it is now. Uh, I, Tell us yeah. a little bit about some of them. Okay. okay. All right. I'm gonna... She's already told me something. <laughs> uh, so well, I, I think we should know. We you should know. know. Yeah. Uh, it was really lovely. I make it do a contrast. Uh, I was really lovely to be here at Brown because you could just bring in anything, and you, you approach a text, you know, as if it's our work as the reader to uh, find out what the landscape of the text is and what are the terms of the text and what are the goals of the text, right? Uh, but at Iowa, there was. Uh, a lot of it has to do with who your cohort is and like who comes to the program. So I think that there are other ideas of uh, when it comes to nonfiction, you might be a more memoir-based uh, writer, maybe used to more straight-up memoir. Um, so I had trouble as myself, you know, uh, having conversations about what the form of the text we're doing, like what the goals of the text were. We want the the there was a little a uh, bit of trouble for folks thinking about uh, content, because the content might be different than other people's experience of the world, but then also the form is different. So it was, it was really, people were like confounded, like what is happening here and why don't I understand and uh, wh what do I do <laughs> about uh, that situation? So it was tricky for me. I thought it would be easier uh, to be at Iowa. But it's also um, something to think about when it comes to departments, right? So we had this one sort of 
outlying new faculty person, which was John. He was like in his 30s. He was new to the faculty. He was like, I want to talk about, you know, lyric essay and all these other kinds of ways of thinking about essays. But the majority of the program was our sort of like, you know, I don't want to say old guard, but like our traditionalists. Um, and so within the department, there wasn't really a consensus about how to think about essays and what essays were doing. So even within the sort of workshop structure, those conversations weren't there, and we're silent, you know, as the workshop be. So it was tricky to think about um, how to guide conversations uh, so they could be really productive. So that was Iowa. It was yeah. three years. I had met then, some great people. And oh, then, and then, know. and then, and then, what did I do? I moved to California, and I got a job working at an investment bank. Mm -hmm. I did. Wow. <laughs> All right. In a part where she emailed me and said she didn't think she wanted to be a writer anymore. Oh, and this is I true. Think you, she said something like, oh, maybe she'll be a librarian. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And then um, I, I actually thought that you had given up on, on writing. Mm -hmm. This was pretty much close to I, the Iowa mm -hmm. experience. And then I met her a couple of years last year. Yeah. At AWP. Here she is. She's writing. She's got all these fellowships. Mm -hmm. So you got to tell us a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. About that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I feel like Iowa was a, a place where you, you doubt, like, is this what I should be doing? <laughs> uh, especially if you don't hear that what you're doing is, hmm, that there are others. You don't feel like you have community, right? So uh, I moved to California. I was just like, I'm just going to be a person. I'm going to, like, uh, through parties. And, you know, that's what I did for my job. My mother got sick. Uh, and so I moved back home to Ohio to be her caretaker. She had a heart transplant. And so while I was in Ohio, I was teaching. I adjuncted at a few places. And I still wasn't writing, still wasn't writing. Um, one, I lived at the hospital. And two, I had like three jobs. And then I was organizing uh, also for uh, as a higher ed person. Um, and it was just very stressful. And I was very tired. So there was no writing for a long time. And then uh, I thought, you know, you, you always you get to these moments where you think, I can quit. Like, I can quit. <laughs> but I think that uh, at the, these moments of desperation in my particular story, writing was all the more important. So, um, yeah, the drive was there. I sent out for some fellowships. I got to go to this one uh, program in Provincetown, which is sort of where I am now. That was my first sort of break. I had seven months just to do my writing. And I was working on this collection of essays from Iowa and also uh, some poems about my mom. So uh, that was the sort of the beginning of like, you can, you can, you know, keep going and it's going to be kind of okay. Uh, and so that's what I did. And um, I did that program. Uh, and then I moved to New York and I worked uh, at another educational sort of like cardiovascular joint. And then I did some more fellowships. I went to Vermont. I worked in arts administration. That's something to think about if you're thinking about how am I going to support myself. Um, arts admin is really great. Also, art writing is really great because they will pay you. Um, so I've did those, done those two things. And then, let's see. Then I went to Oklahoma for a little while, but that residency was not good. And so oh. I got to go. It was not good. <laughs> okay. It's okay. new. It's a new program, and you might want to apply. They're changing up their sort of... Uh, institutional organization there, so I hope it's gonna get better. Um, and that's Tulsa Artist Fellowship is really great, maybe <laughs> for you. Uh, and then I went, and now I'm back at the Fine Arts Work Center uh, in Provincetown. So that's been my trajectory. Um, Excellent, thank you. Okay, and last is Dan Shirell, who was not an English major but was taking writing courses all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us what you have been doing and what you told me you were thinking about doing next. Okay. Sure. Um, so I feel like a little bit of a fraud up here because I'm not a professional writer like these three amazing women. I've never been a professional writer. Um, but I have a deep <laughs> love of writing. <laughs> and um, I took many of Catherine's course, courses at Brown. But the other thing I was doing was um, organizing to try to get Brown to divest from the fossil fuel industry, which took up a lot of my life when I was here. Um, and I graduated and felt like there was no more important work I could be doing than fighting climate change, to say it reductively. Um, so, well first, I went, I lived in Japan for a few months and worked at an environmental education school where I basically built igloos for small Japanese school children to come and learn about the mountains. 
which was the best job I've ever had, and probably <laughs> will ever have. Um, but uh, then I came back to the States and worked for a bit on a campaign to try to get an uh, ambitious climate bill passed in Rhode Island. That passed, moved down to New York City to help organize a really big, half million person sized climate march called the People's Climate March in 2014. Um, was hired by the Sierra Club to run their campaigns in New York to try to shut down the state's remaining coal plants and get money allocated to help those workers transition to renewable energy. Uh, and now for the past two years, I have been managing a coalition of labor unions and environmental justice organizations and community groups who are sort of banding together to try to pass the nation's first carbon tax in New York. So basically trying to take money out of the pockets of wealthy fossil fuel companies and funnel it back mostly into renewable energy and low-income communities who often face the worst burdens from climate change and environmental pollution. So none of that have to, has to do with writing. You didn't, um, write, you didn't write at all? I did. So meanwhile, <laughs> no, behind I mean, the scene, Were you writing when you were doing some yeah. of this activism? So that's, I guess, if there's anything useful I can impart here, it's that um, if writing professionally is not the thing that you're doing, um, even in a crazy stressful job, like there are 143 members of the coalition that I'm coordinating and I'm traveling all around the state constantly, et cetera. Uh, but I really feel like I couldn't do that work if I didn't take time to write. Um, so I've been writing like short little pieces, mostly for myself, mostly not for publication. Um, I published a few pieces here and there. Um, and, but I've also sort of been just, a, I guess I would say, accruing life. Like there's a yeah. lot that has gone into the past four yeah. years that I feel like is burgeoning into something that I really want to get yeah. down on paper. Um, so, and I've thought a lot recently about the fact that um, climate change is such a monumentally huge force that's going to shape the future of our species and our civilization. And there's very, compared to the, the largeness of that problem, there is a, a comparative dearth of writing, especially writing that gets out of the sort of like policy, how we fix it, or politics, this is why the Republicans are bad stuff, both of which are useful and the Republicans are bad. Um, <laughs> but um, writing about how it feels to be um, living in a generation on the brink of such monumental change and also um, sort of the toggling I do kind of constantly between my biographical life where I'm like doing my career and like sending emails or whatever. So I would call that biographical time and then geological time where I'm like feel um, moments of lucidity and grief around what's happening to our planet. And not just to our planet, to the people, mostly poor people that live on our planet. Um, so I really want to think about writing as a way to like hold those two modes of existence in balance, hold them both as true and figure out how to communicate between them. Those two parts myself, those two modes of thinking. Um, and I've been like looking for a book that does that. And there are a few authors that kind of dance around it. Amitav Ghosh has a really amazing book called The Great Derangement. And there's a Swedish Marxist I really love named Andreas Malm, who writes some really good theory around climate change. Uh, but I really want to like, what like Maggie Nelson did for like queer family, like small little snippets, bringing in a lot of threads. I feel like I want a book of, like that about climate change, and it doesn't exist. So I'm going to try writing it, or writing one of said mm -hmm. books. Um, and so in May, I'm going to do this residency out in California called the Mesa Refuge Residency, which is specifically for writing at the edge of nature and society. Um, Rebecca Solnit, who's an author I really admire, had it a few years ago. Um, and I am a little bit apprehensive about transitioning from full-time organizing to full-time writing and like what that's going to feel like. But I also, uh, yeah, it feels really important to my organizing, etc., to be able to like express, yeah, to like block off some time to to figure some stuff out through writing. Yeah. Uh,
will, will you go back to organizing, or you, uh, have you thought that far, or, or are you just, <laughs> um, yeah, probably, I mean, my, there are very few people, I think, who, that I know of who are able to balance, I don't even want to, like, call it activism, because it sort of, like, separates it from the rest of society, but, like, <laughs> who are able to balance political work and artistic work in a way that feels right. So I think Rebecca Solnit is one of the very few, and Amitav Ghosh, to, to name both of them. Um, um, but, so yeah, I want to figure out in my life how to balance those two things and do them both. So eventually, yes, I will go back to, I feel like, the climate movement as a whole is kind of my life's work, but um, there's also a world in which I will be on conference calls till I'm 50, and I don't want to live in that world, so. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all, all for that. And then, um, if you have any questions after, we'll, we'll let you do it. But I, I did want to have them read a little bit of their work. So, Erica, would you mind starting again? Just read, you know, read an excerpt and tell us a little bit about, give us some context. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, I'm going to read from the beginning of the the memoir that I've been working on um, about about the yeah the death of my brother when I was five and. Uh, sort of hmm, trying to understand the silence that has existed in my family about it for a long time and uh, processing some of the grief that I feel and, and how to live with that loss as an adult. Um, so I'm going to read from the beginning. Hopefully it's self-explanatory. I don't know why my brother died. When it comes up, the words feel awkward. My brother died when I was five, I say. The confession makes me blush as if I've said something unseemly. I shift, uncomfortable, wondering if I've struck the appropriate tone. I try not to sound too chatty, but I also don't want to come across as self-pitying. I'm sorry, whoever I'm talking to will say, and I'll nod, thanks. How old was he, they'll ask. Three, I say. Then they'll want to know what happened. We don't know, I say. He woke up one morning having trouble breathing. We took him to the emergency room, and a few hours later, he was dead. I stumble through the explanation, aware that it's not good enough. They didn't find anything in the autopsy, I add. They think it was a virus, but we'll never really know. My answer hangs uncomfortably in the air. Whatever friend or acquaintance or stranger I'm talking to will look at me, waiting for more. But I've told them all I know. My brother died, and 20 years later, I still can't explain it. His name was Paul, but once he was gone, I didn't say his name much. No one did, not my parents or my grandparents or my friends at school. In our house, the photos of him hung in the back hallway, next to the closet where we kept winter coats and snow pants. Sometimes, I'd sneak back there to look. In the photos, my brother is two years old, his face round with a big forehead and wispy blonde curls. At the beach, he rolls happily in the sand, his bare legs and arms coated in it. In our backyard, he wears a hand-me-down jean jacket that comes to his knees, his arms too short for the cuffed sleeves. It's fall, and he's plunked himself down in a pile of leaves, loading fistfuls into his plastic backhoe. At Halloween, his face pokes out from the green stegosaurus costume my mom sewed for him, felt spikes running down his back and into a tail. We pose for pictures in mom and dad's room. I'm an angel, arms spread wide, silver wings pinned to the back of my white leotard. Once in a while, my parents would drive us to the cemetery. We'd park our car and stand around, hands stuffed in coat pockets, our breath frosty as we look down at the small rose quartz stone. Paul, December 10th, 1993 to December 15th, 1996. Once before Christmas, my dad brought a shovel and we planted two holly bushes. Another time, we got out of the car and my little sister Katya started sobbing. Her tears surprised my parents. She hadn't known how to walk or talk when Paul died. They wondered what it was that she remembered. In first grade, I wrote a book about him. 
five pages scrawled in pencil during writing workshop, riddled with misspellings and eraser smudges, a sheet of pink paper stapled to the front. My brother Paul, the title reads, with a stamp across the top, rough draft, November 17th, 1997. On the cover, I use colored pencils to sketch the coffin, a small white box propped up on a silver stand, the lid closed. I read the book aloud to my classmates at circle time. My brother was three when he died. He was a sweet brother. When he died, my sister didn't understand. He had blonde hair and brown eyes. His hair was curly. He liked to play dinosaurs. During his burial, we put flowers on the coffin. It was sad. I cried and cried and cried. My mom and dad cried too. At his funeral, it was sad. My mom and dad cried, and then I cried too. Some people think once someone died in your family, you are never happy again. I think you can be happy again by remembering good things about that person. Try to think about the fun you had, and it will make you smile. Afterwards, I took questions. My friend Carrie raised her hand and told me her mom had read about my brother in the newspaper. She mimicked her mother's hysterics. Oh my God, Erica's brother died, Erica's brother died. I forced a smile, appreciative, but not sure what to say. A boy announced that he knew someone who had died, Princess Diana. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Sabrina, tell, give us some context. Yeah, so this is um, my uh, upcoming column is coming out next week with Catapult, and as I mentioned, it's about sea creatures and also being a minority in America, which is, those are hard things to mix together. Um, and this, is, this essay is called How the Hairy-Chested Yeti Crab Taught Me to Survive Trump's America. <laughs> the hairy-chested yeti crab is a queer creature. Its hairsuit pincers resemble the shaggy leg warmers you'd see at a rave. The crabs live in staggering numbers around deep sea hydrothermal vents, with up to 700 animals congregating within one square meter at a time. They must stay within this precarious margin of safety, between the near freezing temperature of the surrounding waters and the scalding 750 degree <coughs> miasma of the, of, the, of the events. Straying too near or too far could leave them chilled or boiled to death. It's a risky sanctuary, but the only one the crabs have ever known. These ghost white yetis live piled on top of each other, forever scrambling for breathing room. At a distance, the vents seem to be buried under snow. It's a cramped communion, but safe havens like these are scarce in the deep sea. They also withstand unbelievable pressure. At 100 feet below the sea, the human body begins to fold in on itself as the spongy tissues of the lungs contract. At 400 feet, it nears total collapse but at 8,000 feet below, yeti crabs do just fine. Unbeknownst to the crustaceans themselves, yeti crabs gained internet fame in 2016 when they became the star of a popular meme. In it, a yeti crab perches on a grimy rock above the subtitle, this creature has adapted to the crushing pressure and oppressive darkness. I saw this meme for the first time two days after Donald Trump was elected president and I couldn't help but relate. A few months before Trump was elected, I moved to Fremont, Seattle, a neighborhood that is 87.1% white and claims to be the center of the universe. The neighborhood abounded with newly legal dispensaries and Black Lives Matter signs hung in the windows of luxury apartments where black people did not live. I arrived in September, just as the sun left for good. In the winter, the Pacific Northwest can feel a little like the deep sea, dark, frozen, eternally wet. I had few friends in the city, and many of the young people I met worked for some giant tech company that I vaguely understood to be responsible for sucking the soul out of a city I barely knew. I tried to make queer friends, but they lived far away in more diverse neighborhoods that required two transfers by bus. One of my new friends actually lived, actually lived in a bus, but I had to take two buses to get to his bus. <laughs> and in some great logical failing in a city known best for its constant rain, hardly any of the bus stops had overhangs, which left me wet, dripping, and downtrodden like some sad Seattle punchline. Whenever I told people I was unhappy in Seattle, they seemed taken aback. There's definitely a ton of colored people here. A white guy told me at a party, swaying with a solo cup at a luxury apartment building called The Lyric, 
I mean, people of color. That's what I said, right? <laughs> Lonely and tired of searching, I spent my nights watching Blue Planet, a BBC documentary about the ocean. Each episode left me fixated on the bizarre ways in which some animals survive the unfathomable corners of the earth, from arctic tundras to hydrothermal vents. Why did anything evolve to live there in the first place? And why did they never think to leave? On the night of the election, I came home to a party that had turned sour. Half-drunk beers littered the floor, and people had stopped talking except for this one white guy I didn't know. It's just a classic trick by the media, he repeated, though no one cared to listen. They want to make it seem like it's a close call. I excused myself and went to my bedroom to distract myself with Blue Planet. In that episode, a gray whale watches while a pod of orcas devour her calf. She sees it coming from a mile away but has no way to stop it. The calf unravels into white and red ribbons in the orca's jaws until she vanishes completely in a frothing, burgundy cloud. The mother lingers but cannot stay, and she sets off again into a sea that has never felt emptier. In the months following, feeling angry and stuck, I marched more than I ever have before. At the Women's March in Seattle, we packed so tight in two soccer fields that it took three hours before the, cl the crowds cleared out and I set foot on a street. Many things I saw that gray and overcast day were problematic. The pussy hats, the post-racial messages sharpied on signs, but it felt better than watching whales die alone in my room. An hour in, it rained, of course. Until the late 70s, scientists thought that all life was dependent on the sun. When submersibles discovered thriving communities of organisms living on hydrothermal vents a mile and a half under the sea, they assumed the creatures must subsist on marine snow. The pretty term refers to the small flecks of poop and decomposing flesh that fall from the surface of the ocean. But scientists realize that hydrothermal vents, those gushing volcanic cracks in the earth, sustain their own kind of life. The vents exhale hydrogen sulfide, a chemical that is toxic to most living things. But in a chemical form of photosynthesis, certain kinds of bacteria use these sulfides to produce nutrients. Just as grass and redwoods evolved to convert sunlight into food, these deep sea bacteria learned to convert the energy in a toxin to a food of their own. Chemosynthesis is now an accepted scientific fact, but it is unsurprising that scientists assumed that something as strange and iconoclastic as a yeti crab or a tube worm must live off of the scraps of a sun-touched society. I prefer to think of it not as a last resort, but as a radical act of choosing what nourishes you. As queer people, we get to choose our families, Two worms just took it one step further. If we have chosen family, we may as well have chosen energy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and April's gonna uh, read and tell us a little bit about. I'm just gonna read the last page of this uh, essay. So uh, I have a collection of essays I'm working on, mostly about place. Uh, and so I wrote this essay during the polar vortex year. This was after maybe 2014. This was after Trayvon Martin was murdered. Um, and I'm thinking about how we talk about how to recognize human beings and how we train ourselves to recognize human beings. And so I was in Ohio and it was there was snow everywhere and I was thinking about um, I was teaching a section at the university. We were talking about uh, homelessness and who belongs where, and how do you, how do we think about who belongs where? And uh, so, this essay ended up being sort of about snow. I was thinking about also uh, James Baldwin's *Stranger in the Village*. Uh, if you haven't read that, that's really great. Um, and so, each section in this uh, essay has a line uh, from that essay, and then uh, I embark on a scene. So. This line here, oh, it's called Stand Your Ground. Um, this line here, some things may not make sense, but most things will. It's, it says, a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead. A state of innocence long after that innocence is dead. The woman couldn't be more than five foot not, though she did jump a little bit when she screamed. It was a strange kind of exclamation. In the back of the room, we were busy getting coffee, a dozen women milling about in the fellowship area at the church. You know, cookies and clucking. I explained to the woman next to me which carafe held the hot water for tea. I was, 
As usual, the only black person in the room, but I had been around the place for over a year. I wasn't new, I wasn't a stranger, but the woman looked right at me and screamed in genuine fright, as if she'd seen the boogeyman in a place where she had not expected to meet him. Though the room was full of people, no one said anything. No one asked her what she saw or why she screamed. Instead, I asked if she was okay. Uh, what's it worth pushing people away? The ladies who said nothing are worth mentioning because when a 79-year-old woman screams in a room full of people, it belies their knowledge as opposed to their innocence when no one responds to her. It's a shame there's no way I could help her. She seemed rattled but not embarrassed. I wished she was. Her lack of embarrassment just meant she was standing her ground. Though I'm a short woman, usually smiling, uh, not wearing any dark hood. I knew exactly what was going on or not going on in her head. Here's the moment of mercy I bear for her, even if she is afraid to regard it. It belies a double blind arrogance for her actions to say to me that there is no way I could be facing a real cold world she is looking away from. This is one way she defends her house, the house of the world she knows. This is guilt fright, the house where your guilt is hidden. It's especially dangerous weather when my guilt is hidden in my fright because fear is a more stealth emotion than mere indifference. In indifference, at least I feel the aggression of my own ugliness. Guilt fright is unreflective, aggression hidden beneath the cloak of passivity, hidden under the, under the dress of victim behavior. In any case, my guilt and fear and indifference effectively shield me from the magnitude of the mountain of my own feelings. Something changed briefly and suddenly in that woman or else, something young and powerful in her let go, and I'm always aware of the possibility of this change. Yet a lovely woman who means well, she has just fallen into a vacuum of reality, which I understand. It's the way you feel, banked and numb in a storm in winter, having fallen over into the nonsense of snow. Okay. <laughs> the book have you had the books that I'm writing yeah. <laughs> right now <laughs> I know right now it's called refuge and outlook all right mm. great and now Dan great um, so this is one of the things I wrote when I wasn't organizing they're like small weird little like fictional riffs on the lives and processes of writers I really admire um, and they call them tributaries. Um, I'll read three of them if I have the time. Uh, so this one's called Nellie Bly Leaves Her Birth. In the old pictures, apparently, you had to stand very still for a long time. This time was called the exposure. You can imagine the man behind the, camp behind the camera, tented under a canvas hood with an arm and two fingers raised and held, like a clock about to chime. This may have been it for Nellie Bly in her heyday, the tense boredom of the long exposure, the dawn languor on the deck of her steamship as it churned a silty wake down the Suez, the feeling of static motion, the long-held gaze of the world as she inched its circumference. Pulitzer himself had commissioned her to travel the globe in under 80 days and beat the fictional record set by Jules Verne. She may have been used to this, breaking records in a game whose terms were set entirely by the imaginations of men, so that even as she prepared for her departure, she weathered subtle domestications. Whole features on the sturdiness of her frock coat, the contents of her small purse, the quantity of underwear she deemed necessary to bring with her. In the promotional picture taken with the long exposure somewhere in the port of Hoboken on the morning her ship sailed, you see this in her face, the weariness of a woman waiting for the rest of the world to match her pace. She made it in 72 days, and knowing this, we have to smile. We have to smile with her as her ship rounds Penang and she opens the door of her berth at night, and over the railing she sees the small lights in the dark hills along what, in those days, were called the Straits of Settlement. Uh, this one's called Barry Hannah Visits an Old House. Barry Hanna, the famous Southern author, lived briefly on a farm. 
the crops were leaf greens and pigs. He slept poorly in a Winnebago on the property. It was the winter south. The trees shuffled in close, and in the morning his breath was wet and cold. He heard deer getting shot at in the wall of woods behind his trailer. Barry had a routine that winter that he never stuck to. Breakfast, drugs, the word, the farm, the bar. Usually he'd skip the word and go straight to the bar, where he'd blaze out fast on bourbon and do the long, dark slide. While he lasted, though, he was a crowd unto himself, holding court at the long table on the porch. He was eager to tell people about the fall of the South, which was still ongoing. The fall of the South was easiest to make out against the backdrop of the past. Once, he'd visited an old, old house in the rain-strafed gullies by Cullman. Stepping past the rain and under the lintel, he saw a wide room with a cauldron hanging from a hook in the ceiling. The original house had no chimney, but every night the food in the cauldron produced a thick smoke. The children of the family took damp rags and rubbed the smoke into the wooden walls, and over generations there accrued a very subtle burnish. This house was a holdover from the south of objects. The pool hall, the writer's block, the hunting season, this now was the south of movement. Accrual was less limited, was limited and less relevant. His Winnebago, Hannah liked to admit, had been pre-built in a factory and trucked to his P.O. box in installments. He went home to it after leaving the bar. It had two rooms and four wheels. The inside walls were fiberglass. He supposed it could travel someday. And then this last one is called Yasunari Kawabata Remembers the Death of an Old Friend. Driving home to Kanagawa on a night in summer after the war, his car leaves its ghost on the road and noses into the low pines circled blackly in the headlights. Yasunari lowers his window. In comes the new radio of the insects, along with the air that, this high up in the mountains, gives him the impression of being stretched taut across the loom of the woods. He sits with a wrist in each hand, feeling the air insist down his throat. Someone has built a small wooden shrine on the side of the road, and two of its red candles, already dead, for, already dead for he'd seen no light, have been knocked to the ground, which is pelted in dry needles. At the mechanics in a small town, five towns distant from Kanagawa, Yasunari steps through a low door. As usual, he has the feeling of other men quieting their laughter when he walks in. Something about his unsmiling stoop, the thinness of his wrists and neck, elicits a reluctant sobering in uneducated men. He is easily resented like a school teacher in the prefectures of the rice harvest. The men in the shop shuttle efficiently under the chassis of the car. An empty carapace covered in small hungry beetles. He looks away. There is a photo of him taken by his publisher. He is kneeling at his writing desk in a loose black robe, looking down at his papers. The picture is taken at a distance. On all sides, he is surrounded by shining mats of tatami, stretching out from him like a lake from an island. This picture gives him a strange feeling. He feels he isn't in it at all, or like he is in it somewhere, but too small to make out. His friend Mishima spoke often about this picture. This is how you seem to them, Kawabata, like you're carrying around a moat of tatami, like even after years they remain on the bare wood at the edges, balancing on one foot to remove their shoe. His eyes smart in the oil smoke. The men wipe the grease blood of his car onto the legs of their overalls. One of them opens the hood and gestures for him to look. The insides offend him, the intestinal complexity of them. The pipes and wires tangle into each other, and black grit clings to the knot of the engine, collecting in its teeth. He would like time and space enough to consider these things singularly, but they are too crowded. He is overcome by a need for what is simple. He wades for it through his dense and ugly head. Just before he took himself, Mishima had admonished him. Complex holes arise from the combination of simples. Yasunari concentrates on this. He remembers the simple blade, the single stroke, the new patterns on the carpet. It is starting to make sense for him. The entire engine clarifies itself into parts. One curved tube disappearing into a black corner, three identical red disks, a sheer plastic plane, the dark shop itself, these silent men, and the road to Kanagawa, which would be hours until he reached. 
Yeah, we'll open up the floor for questions, and you guys can ask one another questions as well. Um, so, let's hear it. <laughs> you can ask them anything. Oh, and I have this. <laughs> I'm supposed to pass this around so they can record your question. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. I'm supposed to be able to toss it, but I'm amazing. <laughs> so do I? Do I go straight in? Oh, that's really exciting. Uh, thank you. This is like a conch shell. We can pass it around. Uh, so glad you guys could come back. Thank you very, very much for doing it, and it's so great to see you all. And uh, I had a twofold question. I was thinking, what is the maybe biggest piece of advice you'd give somebody as a writer while at Brown? And then secondly, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give somebody right after they graduate for trying to do what it is you're doing? So, thank you. Um, I actually wrote down a list of things that I wanted to say in case no one asked me them. So I'm just gonna say them now. Um, actually, the first piece of advice is a advice that John gave me when I took humor and satire writing, which was a great class, but he reminded all of us to treat the writing that we do at Brown as not like preparation for writing that you're doing in the real world, but writing that you should submit to places. And like this kid in my class submitted something that we wrote in that class and it was published while we were in the class, which felt like, whoa, that it's not just something that people remind you, it's so real. And I also published a piece that I wrote for that class. So like always keep those Google Docs, um, but also like never be afraid to revisit an old piece. Like maybe you wrote it when you were younger, maybe it needs a fresh eye, but maybe it was really great and you can submit it somewhere. Um, also, always negotiate <laughs> when you have a job offer. Never tell them how much you made at your previous job because it's illegal for them to ask in New York, um, but always negotiate up. I say this especially to women and people of color and everyone who is not a cis white man, um, but also you should negotiate as well. Um, <laughs> also, if you ask for like an informational, like don't be afraid to ask people for informational interviews. Like ask older writers you admire, ask them out to coffee, like buy them lunch, just like DM them on Twitter. Um, but if you do do that and they say, hello, yes, I can meet with you, don't ghost them. Um, that happens a lot to me. Uh, not a lot, but like several times and it makes me really sad because mm. I never reached out to them, but they reached out to me and I was like totally like tomorrow is really good and they just never reached out again. Um, and then if you do have coffee with them, yeah, it's rough. Um, if you do have coffee with them, write a thank you email. It's very kind and it'll like keep your name in their, in their mind, um, even if they're not in a position to help later on. Um, also, find mentors who share identities with you. I feel like, um, especially working in like science journalism as a person of color, it's been so difficult and so alienating. And like for a long time, I was like, I'm an intern, like I can't talk to anyone about these things that I'm feeling. But like, reach out to like, if you're a woman, reach out to like other women, like reach out to other kinds of marginalized people who work in this office because they'll probably sympathize with you and like you can have these conversations that will make the whole internship a lot easier. Um, yeah, that's those are the main things that I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else? Oh, I, well, I can answer the okay, this one okay. if you want anything else on that. Um, I guess looking back, uh, working on the indie was really really well prepared me. I think to uh, to publish professionally, just to be sort of in the habit of sort of writing quick, clean copy, having that edited. Um, and putting it out into the world. Um, and then also the, I just like was, I don't know, I'm still astounded by the network um, of other people I know who I worked on the indie with who are now in New York and are professional colleagues and people who can pass along information about jobs or recommend you for jobs or, you know, it is a really sort of special privilege <laughs> of going to Brown and it has been really helpful career wise. Um, I guess I would just add um, less on the professional guys, but I think one thing that's kept my writing alive while I'm organizing and vital is reading voraciously and reading really widely and almost at random. Like I, lo I think it's very easy for me at least to read down a certain vein. And I think the, the zeitgeist and the book blogs and everything like points you towards certain books. 
and I like to go to bookstores or libraries and pick out a book that I would never otherwise read and have never heard of. Um, like this piece about Nellie Bly, I just wrote it after reading. She has this amazing account of traveling the world in 72 days in like the late 1800s that like nobody's read for 40 years. <laughs> and it's fascinating and bizarre. Um, so yeah, I kind of think of like my reading as like sucking in as many voices and perspectives as possible. And I think uh, it keeps my writing more interesting, at least to me. See the shell. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Can we pass that down? Keeps everybody on their toes too. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, I'm really intrigued by April's career directory, trajectory. Um, how do you get an investment banking job if you've been working as a writer? <laughs> <laughs> I That's like temp companies, and that is how. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like temp companies, especially if you, you're moving to a new city, and maybe you don't have like a network set up. It's really great to keep your people at Brown and make sure you talk to them because that's how you get jobs. Like, I don't know what anybody else has told you, but it really is about how, who you know. Um, and so I ended up getting just this temp job, and yeah, this was like right before the crash, and the company I worked with actually didn't crash. They were just, they, their tradition was in farming insurance, and so um, I just threw, you know, wine and cheese parties for them, and it was interesting. Like, it was interesting, because I came in with a certain idea about like what the finance world was like, and I left with a different idea about it. Uh, yeah. Did you learn anything that you could use in writing? Um, I learned things that would help me in other jobs. So that job was mostly about uh, attending to people, uh, individuals, remembering names, noticing if people had haircuts and what their granddaughter's <laughs> name was, that kind of like uh, people detail uh, stuff. And that's great for writing, period. Um, but it also helped me on uh, other kinds of front-facing jobs uh, later in life. So. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Any more questions? Do you have a question for me? Yeah. Come on here. Um, I was curious if any of you did um, theses while at Brown and if you had any advice about that process. Mm, I did a thesis. It was fun. I think um, advice. I don't know. I hope everyone does one. I think they're great uh, just to have as practice working on something that's a little bit longer um, and taking advantage of the resources here. Get yourself with Carol. Like, get us together. It'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I also did a thesis at Brown. Um, I think, yeah, well, it, it was really fun. Um, and it was a really, uh, I guess, great opportunity to work with professors more closely. That was, yeah, just to build those relationships. Catherine and I worked with Kate Trapira, and yeah, the, I just think I just learned a lot from those mentors. I also wrote a thesis, um, and I feel like theses are always like this huge thing that you birth, and then it's like, oh, that didn't look like what I thought it was gonna be, but like I still really like it. Um, I think that, I, like I obviously don't have an experience like writing a longer book or anything, but um, I feel like r just having to deal with so much material really helped me in terms of like being able to self-edit, which is really, really helpful when you freelance and when you write anything. Like it's one of the strongest skills you can have just in terms of like developing good relationships with editors and like proving to them that you can write clean copy. Um, and I, I did this thing in my thesis where I would color code certain areas that like needed work or felt really good for now or like that's so bad but I, I know I need a transition and that's going to be there but I need to address it. Um, and that's like a technique that I still use that I don't think I would have developed if I hadn't been dealing with something that was like 36,000 words about whales. So. Um, this isn't exactly a writing question, but it's more a practicality question. So a lot of you mentioned that you live in New York City and you had to locate there after college. Um, and New York is expensive. And I don't know, like talking about your experience, like making that work as it's quite daunting and also maybe add on the question, do you feel it's necessary to be in New York to be successful? I 
I don't think it's necessary. <laughs> um, it's definitely it's challenging. Uh, rents are high. Uh, I had roommates. I I, I do th like there are doable situations to be found for sure. Um, but I think I mean I guess what I would say, I felt very strongly that I wanted to work in media, and there, are, as far as I know, a lot more media jobs in New York than any other city in the country. Um, but. I don't know. I don't know if I, if that's not what you want to do. I don't think I think you can be a writer very successfully in a lot of places. Probably more successfully in a place where the rents are a little lower. <laughs> um, I see. So yeah, I currently live in Brooklyn, and I pay more than I'd like, and I like see rats all the time, and I can't use my <laughs> bathtub, but because um, <laughs> it's grimy. Um, but I did, like, I lived in Seattle for six months, and I was really excited about that because I'd interned every single summer in New York and knew that it was really hard, and I would, like, get my $10, <laughs> I, my first internship, I made $8 an hour, I mean, $8.50 an hour, and my other friend was, like, doing a CS internship at the New York Times, and we'd go out for drinks, and I'd be like, one beer and she would say I'll have an apt as well yeah. and I was like this makes me feel really weird and like it like not as good as everyone else and um then I tried Seattle for a bit which is like also a very expensive place to live but I did feel like as someone who didn't have a steady job at a specific publication I felt incredibly isolated there are freelancer groups like in every city and they are really helpful and like one of the biggest recommendations I can make just wherever you live, like find people who are also doing what you're doing because they'll give you tips. Like there are listservs to like talk about opportunities. It's really helpful. But I felt very alone and like a lot of the things that I, a lot of the jobs and opportunities that I've gotten, I've like, I've heard of because I went to a meetup with like other science writers or I'm on this listserv. And um, I feel like I am really happy that I'm in New York and I wouldn't move out even though I know that I'm hemorrhaging money. Um, okay, it's not that bad. You can, you can make it work. You don't have to live in the West Village. Um, but I think that like being able to just meet up with the, with the editors who are editing me and like being able to go into an office and just meet new people has been really, really helpful. And since moving, also, yeah, I think I just also thrive on like writers groups and like, you know, you know inter human interaction with other people who are doing what you're doing. So I think that it can help and you definitely don't have to be there. Um, but if you are freelancing, it is, it, it, yeah, it can really help. Can you give us a little bit of um, some advice about freelancing and pitching and getting that uh, started? Um, yeah, so I would say the biggest thing about freelancing first is that I think it is impractical to think that you can graduate and then freelance because you, ha you don't have any connections. Like you don't know specifically editors and I think you really need to build those up over time. Um, I One of my friends freelances full time in Seattle and she was like, it took me two years to be able to sustainably freelance. And by her definition of freelance, she means like, yeah, sometimes I go on international reporting trips to Myanmar, but also I fact check for like discover. And that's like another freelancing that is so steady. And like, I would encourage you to expand your definition of what freelancing can be, whether that's copy editing or fact checking or researching or transcribing, like any kind of steady gig is really helpful. However, I think that if you do want to go and like write long for, or like write whatever you want to write as a freelance writer, it really helps to have a day job. And it will be a very exhausting process. Like even right now I have this nine to five and then I, right now I'm working on two stories for Audubon and I like just finished up this column and I haven't really slept a lot and it's like, I feel alive, but I also feel dead. <laughs> um, and I think that like it's, I can't even imagine if I didn't have the steady job, like where I would cobble together the money. Because also, very helpful freelance note, if you are not, if you are a freelancer, you'll get, you'll get paid in 1099 MISCs, um, which is pre-tax. So if you get a check for $500, you gotta put half of that away because you have to pay the IRS back um, those taxes because they don't take the taxes out of your um, freelance check, just a general note. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and I would also say in terms of pitching um, stories to places, know that every publication will have staff writers who will write the obvious stories or write the exciting stories. Like, if you're trying to start writing about music, you can't just be like, Pitchfork, I want to review that new Frank Ocean album because obviously <laughs> they have someone for that. And like when I started out freelancing, 
I like emailed National Geographic and I was like, I would like to cover this store in manta rays. And they were like, obviously someone's already doing that. And so you can like work your way up to a place where they'll trust you as a ready, like as a, as a regular freelancer who will do these kind of like one-off study stories. But it helps if you come in with a very specific pitch that you have a specific angle on or a specific reason why you can write it. Like um, I remember I was in Seattle and I was like really just trying to freelance and I was like, hey, there's an octopus that's going to be like released into the ocean. Um, on Valentine's Day, because like in, from the Seattle Aquarium, because she decided that she wasn't going to mate with this male octopus, and I feel like it's a feminist thing. And the person was like, "Cool, like can you go and get photos?" And I was like, "Yeah." And then that happened, and like that was the cool thing of not being in New York and being a freelancer, because only I, well, other people had access to that story in Seattle, but like it was a specific thing that I could bring that other people couldn't. And then once you have that relationship, then people will be like, "Oh, there's a study about manta rays. Do you want to do it?" Um, but yeah. Do you remember the first time you, you pitched it was successful, it was, was accepted? Well, yeah, the, I mean, most of the freelancing that I've done, also just to be very frank, is from places that I've worked before, okay. um, where I have developed relationships with editors. So like, um, a lot of times the freelance things I'll get from Audubon will be because my, uh, my editor will reach out and be like, can you write 10 captions about how fancy these female birds are? And I will say, yes, I will do that. <laughs> um, but I think that the... First, I don't. I think honestly, it was a piece of writing that I did for John's class. Um, it was about this trip that I had taken to Bora Bora, and this time that everyone thought that I was married to my dad, and I just and that was the thing that I pitched. That I I didn't even pitch. I just gave them the essay, and they were like, "Cool, yeah, we'll run, we'll we'll run with this." Um, and in terms of like pitches that I've done, I think that I've already had a relationship with that editor, and they've like known. Okay, well, I can trust this person because I've. Um, so you know, I guess I didn't really answer specifically your question. No, it's okay. I, a lot of people have said that they also, it's very important to try to get internships while you're here uh, as undergraduates, and that seemed to be you know, <coughs> one, one track, just uh, getting those kinds of networking things started. I, you did? You, uh, yeah, and I, I think especially if you're an intern, if you can try to get clips that's going to be so helpful to you because then when you're going to try to get clips and try as much as you can to meet with an editor who you know you're interested in and um then yeah then when you leave you'll have sort of these clips that when you're pitching someone you can be like i've written this this and this and hopefully if you know an editor you know it's a lot they're more likely to read and respond to your email than if they've never heard of you yeah another thing um people have uh, expressed as, as alums is that you may find yourself with a job, but not the kind of writing you want to do, and how do you deal with that? I mean, you said something about the, along those lines, yeah. and you didn't really want to be doing that kind of work. You, this is the kind of work that you wanted to do, the, this memoir. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, um, I mean, I really wanted to work at The Cut, and I think it's a great website. I still do. Um, but I definitely found over the course of working there that I was, uh, I don't know, doing a lot of blogging, very sort of quick one-off things that, um, that what? It just didn't actually feel like what I was best at as a writer and, and not what I wanted to do. Um, and so it, uh, but you know, but it's also something that can pay the bills. And so I think um, and it's still something I do from time to time because, you know, yeah, because it, it's fun. But um, I think it's also a, for me, it's a very different headspace, like writing up like a news post or something like that versus, you know, working on memoir writing. And so it was sort of a realization like, oh, when I, I don't know, thinking about how you're using your writing energy. Um, and I think over time realizing that I wanted to, to yeah, to, make sure I was prioritizing the writing that felt most urgent and important to me. Um, I guess, how did you guys, or when and how did you guys come into your identity as believing yourself as writers and imposter syndrome and stopping yourself from writing tips and tricks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wait, you ought to say something because he, he started by saying 
That is true. I did start with that, didn't I? You did. I started with an admission you know, of being an imposter. You're such a gift, uh, gifted writer. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you were torn, torn apart by the different uh, tracks that you were taking, except that. All right, I'll, I'll be quiet. No, no, no. I, 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 mean, I, I love to hear. Yeah. I think. I mean, personally, I think I came into my identity. This is. This is not. This is not staged. I think I came into my identity as a writer in Catherine's class. Um, I know <laughs> that was cheesy, but it's true. Um, I think there are professors at this school who are willing to take your writing really seriously, and when they tell you your writing is good, it's not just undergraduate good; it's just like legitimate, real world good. Um, and there is nothing. There's nothing different between you and like 27 year olds who are writing for whatever <coughs> the New Yorker except a degree, right? So um, I think don't take the encouragement with a grain of salt. Take it seriously and take yourself seriously. Um, and yeah, I think for me it's been, because I've been out of the game for so long, it's a little bit, uh, it feels intimidating to switch gears like that. But it also, I was at this book talk recently with Zadie Smith and some other guy. And she was interviewing this other guy, and he was just awful. I really didn't like him. I know, she kept, he kept like talking over her, and it was a bad interview. But he did say one thing that stuck with me, which is that, because he, oh, he's the guy that wrote Mad Men, and now he wrote his own book. And Mad Men is not a show I really like, and the book is not one I've read. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, he said something like, um, you know, I knew I needed to write a book because if I didn't write this book, it was gonna kill me. And like to some extent, I feel that urgency about writing, uh, and I try to listen to it. Yeah, that's helpful. It sounds dramatic, but it's, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I think uh, I had a lot of, I felt really good about myself as a writer after coming through and having all these great professors, and it was a fun time. Uh, and then I lost some confidence when I went to graduate school. And after that, lots of people don't write ever again. Some people will take them three years. Most of my friends, it took them two to three years to just get back into yeah. the sort of like rhythm of what it's gonna be like and how to listen to yourself again. And I would recommend anger. Anger has been really helpful for me in terms of like asserting my like uh, my personhood, my subjectivity on the page as taking the page as a place that like, that's my house and I run this. <laughs> That's good advice. I, um, you, graduate school can be very damaging to to write. You can really start. To, no, you can you start. You can doubt yourself, and you know. I I thought that was what was happening. And so, so uh, but listen to what April was saying. Uh, you know, you can come. You come out of it. So don't go to graduate school with with um, crazy expectations. Uh, and it can be. I know you're you. You have a good cohort, but it can be, just if you go to Iowa, it's really competitive there and can be pretty cutthroat. I know you said you had a good time and met good people, but, um, you know, so. Uh, you never know who you're going to get. But this idea of knowing and, um, you know, uh, people are telling you that you're a good writer and hopefully they, they really mean it, uh, then keep, try to keep that spirit. Um, and it, is, it has, isn't easy, right? You, you talked about doubt. I don't know if you were taught, I don't think you were doubting yourself as a writer when I met you, but um, I, I'm not sure. Um, and I don't know about you in, in terms of doubt. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel <laughs> doubt a lot. <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, for me, graduate school actually has been a really positive experience. And, and especially finding the community of people who are like reading your work. Um, and uh, I don't know. And I guess just like writing alone can be really isolating. And I think breeds a lot of like doubt. Like, why am I doing this? What are, like is this? Is anyone ever going to read this? And so I think being able to, yeah, like have, you know, either a workshop class or just a writer's group or something, people who can kind of like reflect back that they're like, they're getting stuff and it's, it's working and it's worthwhile has been helpful for me. Yeah, I think also a quick note on imposter syndrome. Um, something that someone said recently has like really just revolutionized my 2018. 
Um, it was a tweet that I read and that person said, my goal for 2017 was to get 100 rejections. And then they went through and they talked about like, I pitched this thing and like it didn't work out and I pitched this thing and it didn't work out. And then like, I'm on my 13th pitch, like something worked out and like, and trying to get 100 rejections, they had written like 37 stories like about things that they were really interested in. And I was like, that is such a helpful framing device because it's so hard to, because uh, like, of course, like half people don't even read your pitch if you are not really sending it to a specific editor who has a reason to listen to you. And so I think if you frame this as like, yeah, maybe I'm going to get rejected, but I just want to actually have that experience. And the more pitches you write, the better you become in it. Mm -hmm. And if you are at all worried that your pitch is bad, know that there has been a much worse pitch by this really confident white dude who's like, I'm going to cover Burning Man for you, Rolling Stone. <laughs> and like, the, like, and editors get that all the time. And something yeah. else that I will say is that it's so easy for editors to get a secret pitch and then delete it. And so if they respond and they say, thanks so much, like this isn't really what we're looking for, that's a huge in. That's like the, an editor saying that like, yes, I acknowledge you as a human and as a writer, as someone that like maybe wants to work with me, like pitch me again. And then pitch them and pit, like don't Do annoy it. them, don't send them like ever, like a pitch every day, but if they respond to you and if they say pitch them again, like that is a really concrete like wish that they're expressing that you do because editors always need writers. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, if, if there are no more group questions, I, I encourage you to go and talk to people individually uh, for a few more minutes before we have to take off to go get dinner. But come and mm -hmm. say hello. They're great. They're great people. So <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you.